Okay, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as Renee said, I'm from Child's Voice. We are a school, a spoken and um, spoken language school located in Wooddale. We teach children with hearing loss. So I'm going to give you um, just where's my clicker? Um, well, oh, there we go. Um, just give you a brief overview on how we hear, the um, different types of hearing loss, the educational options that are available to children who have a hearing loss. Um, some strategies, some strategies and tips for you all, and then um, some talking about some reading with children with hearing loss. So I have a slide at the end for questions, but please feel free if you have a question in the middle of when I'm, you know, talking about something, just you know, shout it out, and you don't have to wait till the end. So um, how do we hear? The ear is divided into three parts that lead up to the brain. Um, I'm sorry, this is small. We have the outer ear here, which consists of the pinna, which is the little flabby part that you, that you see. Um, and then it goes into the ear canal. And this little brick thing right there is the eardrum. And then these three bones, which are very hard to see, are the ossicles. And those are actually the tiniest bones that you have in your body. And I actually have a little demo of these. And they're the tiniest bones in your body, but they're one of the most, they're one of the three most important bones for hearing, so let's pass that around if you'd like to see that. Um, and so, and then we have the inner ear, which consists of the cochlea, which looks like a snail. It's, it's a bony structure, and inside of the cochlea there's hair cells, and there's fluid. So when sound goes into your ear, it really, it's kind of like the progression through. So it comes in through the pinna, goes through the ear canal, and into the eardrum, and there it starts vibrating. And it goes through, and then when it goes into the cochlea, the, the fluid in there starts to move, and the hair cells vibrate, and it goes off onto the, into the brain. So that is how we hear. And then when we talk about children with hearing loss, there's things that kind of go wrong in each of those processes that can attribute to hearing loss. So there are three causes of hearing loss. Congenital hearing loss acquire hearing loss, and then, like everything, the unknown. There's always an unknown. Um, so a congenital hearing loss is present at birth. So when the child is born, they have the hearing loss. They go through, each child goes through the newborn hearing screening, and they fail that screening, and they are diagnosed immediately. Something is wrong immediately, as soon as they are born. So the cause could be genetic or hereditary. Um, it could be caused by issues during pregnancy or um, just, um, caused by issues that happened during birth. So for genetics, more than 50% um, of hearing loss is caused by genetics. So there's something with the, you know, the, a mother gene or a father gene that just kind of goes, goes wrong and impacts the development of hearing. It could be just something that happens on the mother's side, something that happens on the father's side, or something that happens, both of them kind of combined. Um, and genetic hearing loss can affect all aspects of the ear, so the outer ear, the middle ear, or the inner ear. Um, and it can cause varying degrees of hearing loss. So a child could have just a mild hearing loss, or they could have a profound hearing loss where they, they don't hear anything. So it, it really, it can vary. Um, some examples of genetic hearing loss is Connexin 26, um, which is a gene mutation that, it, 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 it's just a mutation and then if both parents have that mutation, the child will have a hearing loss. If just one parent has that mutation, the child could have a hearing loss, but they could for sure pass it on to their offspring. So if both parents have it, the child is gonna have a hearing loss. <coughs> and at Child's Voice, a lot of our children, that is the cause of hearing loss, that connects in 26 mutation. Um, Down syndrome and Usher, Usher syndrome can also cause hearing loss. Usher syndrome is a, a child has a hearing loss, but then they also have a progressive vision loss. So these kiddos start usually with, you know, perfect vision, but they have the hearing loss. And then as time goes on, they might lose like their peripheral vision. And then they, you know, then they can't, they have the night vision issues. And then unfortunately they go totally blind. So it's a, the hearing loss is present immediately, but the, the vision loss is progressive. And we've had some kiddos at, at Child's Voice that have had Usher syndrome, and they're in, it's, 
they're in varying stages. So it's not like, oh, by age three, they've lost their night vision by age five. Um, it's, it's progressive. And so some children, when they're with us, you can tell like, they have glasses, you know, they did have glasses and they suddenly have glasses. Then you turn the lights off in the classroom and they're the kids that like cling to your side. So it's, um, it's a tricky one. It's, it's, um, so then there's some pre, um, prenatal, the prenatal and birthing issues. So some non-genetic factors, some illnesses um, like bacterial meningitis, measles, encephalitis, anything that the mother can get when she's pregnant can have effects on the children. Um, and then some in utero infections, such as toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, and, um, and then toxins consumed by the mother. Unfortunately, you know, in the perfect world, we would like all parents or all mothers to make the great choices during pregnancy. Unfortunately, some don't know that they were pregnant and some things that they do affects the child. And then some birthing issues, some ventilators or ototoxic medications. And for those, those typically, you don't just give a child strong medication just because. Usually it's for a life-saving illness or something is happening. And so it's kind of a, it's a twofold. Like, well, you need to give the child the medication in order for them to survive. But then there's a chance that they're gonna have a hearing loss at the same time. Then um, another type of hearing loss is the acquired hearing loss. And so this happens after birth. So the child is born, they have you know, normal hearing, and then boom, something happens. It can occur at any time. It could occur two weeks after birth, it could occur two years after birth, 10 years, at any point in time. Could be due to otitis media, which is chronic ear infections, um, which if any of you are parents, I'm sure you have experienced that. I know my son had ear infections, it seemed like every week, and it can cause, you know, severe it can cause hearing loss. Again, the ototoxic medications, the diseases that I mentioned before, head injury, if they're playing sports and they get banged in the head, it could cause a hearing loss. Perforated eardrum, which is a tear or a hole in the eardrum, very painful, very, very painful. And then noise exposure. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about noise exposure um, in a little bit. Um, so for noise, the level and the length of time. So if you just hear one firework close, you're not gonna cause it, you're not gonna have a hearing loss. But if you're sitting next to those fireworks for a half an hour and they're just going off right by your ear, it, it, you, could, you could definitely get a permanent, permanent hearing loss. So it's the level and the length of time that you're exposed to that. And then unfortunately, there's many cases that are just unknown. Parents, when they find out that their child is deaf, they can go through genetic counseling and try to determine what the cause was. Some parents choose to. Some parents are like, well, it is what it is. It's not gonna change anything to know why this child has a hearing loss. They have a hearing loss, let's move on. And others want, I mean, it's not gonna change anything, but they just want to know for the future. And a lot of times it's very disappointing for them because they're just, they cannot find that reason. So, and a lot of the children at Child's Voice also have you know, like I said before, they, it was due to Connects in 26. A lot of them, these parents just tirelessly try to find out what's wrong, and they can't. Um, do you have any questions about that so far? Okay. Um, so then there are three different types of hearing loss. There's a conductive hearing loss, sensory neural, and mixed. The conductive hearing loss affects the outer ear and the middle ear. So sound is, something is, obstructing sound from going in in the ear. Um, it usually can be corrected medically or surgically, and the hearing loss is typically mild to moderate. Again, some causes of that are ear infections. When you have all that fluid in your ear, it causes, you know, if, you, if you've ever had like water get stuck in your ear after a shower, after swimming, it's, you can tell, it's a, you know, there's something in there. Um, allergies can cause ear infections. Again, the perforated eardrums, um, tumors, swimmer's ear, that water in your ear. Foreign object. You would not believe how many times kids stick an <laughs> M&M or a kernel of popcorn. Like, why? I don't know. But it's like, ooh, does this, you know, what does this do? That can cause a hearing loss. Because in a parent can just look and be like, oh, I don't see anything in there. But if they get it in far enough, you're not going to be able to see it. And so that child is going to have a hearing loss in that ear. Again, it could be corrected medically or surgically simply by 
pulling whatever it is out. Um, but sometimes when they, depending on what they stick in their ear, it can cause serious damage. If there's a sharp edge, it could cut the eardrum and the ear canal, and, um, and then the absence or malformation of the outer ear, ear canal, or middle ear. Then there's a sensory neural hearing loss, which is the inner ear. So something is going on in the inner ear with the cochlea, something that's not working right. Maybe they're missing hair cells, maybe those hair cells are damaged, but something inside is not working. And this cannot just be corrected with surgery or with um, some medicine. The hearing loss is typically permanent, but it could also be just a mild, this could be a permanent loss, but it could be a mild permanent. Um, again, due to genetics, illnesses, medications, head trauma, malformation, and again, exposure to loud noises. And then a mixed hearing loss is just a combination of that conductive hearing loss paired with the sensory neural hearing loss. So something might be going on you know, with an outer ear and then also with the cochlea and the inner ear. Um, so the hearing loss varies again from mild, they could have a mild hearing loss to a profound hearing loss. And typically the way individuals describe it is that sounds are softer and just harder to understand. Do you have any questions about that? So this is an audiogram and this is a, it's just a graphical display of a hearing test. And this is just, this is a blank one. I'm gonna show you some completed ones, but this is blank. So at the top you have the frequencies that go, I'm sorry if you can't see that, from 125 up to 8,000. And frequency is measured in Hertz. And then on the vertical axis, we have the hearing level or the intensity, and that's in decibels. So zero <coughs> is right, you know, the, the normal range, and then up to 120. And, oh, this is what I said. Um, so then there are some, here, wait, let me go, let's just go back, yeah. So if you look at, this, so the zero to 15 decibel range would be, would be normal here, and this is where we would fall in. And then, so 15 to about 25 is you have a, we call a slight hearing loss. So you can hear most things, but you do, there's some, like some high frequency sounds that you might not be able to hear. And then as it progresses down, you're down here, you have a profound hearing loss. You can't hear anything. You might be able to feel some vibrations but you could have you know, a jet airplane fly right over your head and you might feel the vibration, but you're not, going to, you're not going to hear that. And if any of you watch Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> he, um, Neil, I think is his name, has a profound, profound hearing loss. And that's why he talks when he's dancing. Like he, sometimes he, can, he said he can feel the vibrations, otherwise he can't and his partner has to like tap him and say like, okay, go, you know, so. So this is a sample audiogram of actually one of our kiddos. And this right here is called the speech banana. And this is where most of the speech sounds occur. So when we're talking, they're in this range. So this is where this child is hearing. So she is not hearing any of the speech sounds. So she is anywhere from 110 to about 120 decibel hearing loss. So she has a profound hearing loss. And if you look, um, the right ear, we mark it with either a circle or a triangle, and then the left ear is an X, just so we can differentiate. So both ears, she has a profound loss in both, in both ears. And this, this little girl actually was, um, this was done in May of 2015. So she was, how old was she then? About, she was about two and a half when this was done. And then in February, she was implanted, bilaterally implanted. And so now you can see her hearing levels are much closer to that speech banana. Still not quite up there, but much closer. And she's newly implanted. And I'm gonna talk about implants in a little bit, but it's a process. And you don't just, it's, it's a misconception. Oh, you stick an implant on and they can hear. That's not how it works. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So she's still in that developing process of getting her sound where it needs to be. And this is a little guy who was implanted back in 2010, and he is well within that, that speech banana. So he's actually graduating this year, and he's going to the mainstream, and will be just fine. 
he will do just fine. But so he went through child's voice and went through this process of kind of training those ears to get to, get to where he is now. So there's the speech banana again, and you can tell um, like all this, the speech sounds, most of them are in there. And then you can also see somewhere, somewhere the other sounds. So like the jackhammer, 120 decibels, um, fireworks, a very loud fan, airplanes, and then like leaves rustling and birds just talking. So where you can just kind of get a sense of when you're doing things, where they kind of fall on the loudness scale. So how loud is too loud? Um, fireworks at three feet, way too loud. Don't stand near fireworks ever. Um, but a whisper, a quiet library, so all of your environments is about 30 decibels. Um, so typical conversation, a dryer, dishwasher, 60 decibels. Um, busy traffic, 70 decibels. A drill, 100 decibels. Um, an MP3 player at maximum. 110 decibels. So it just kind of gives you an, a range. And you know, I'm always shocked by the hair dryer because you know what woman does sorry for the thing here, what woman doesn't use a hair dryer? And it's 80 to 90 decibels. So it's kind of, I mean you have to kind of think about that. And obviously you're not standing for three hours drying your hair, hopefully. But um, just kind of gives you an idea to think about how loud things are. So um so when we talk about hearing loss when we say, okay, your child has a hearing loss, there's a couple different ways that we describe it. So if it's a bilateral or unilateral, bilateral means they have a hearing loss in both ears. Unilateral means it's just one ear. So they would have, could have normal hearing on, on the left ear, but have a hearing loss on the right ear or both ears. Symmetrical and asymmetrical meaning, symmetrical meaning it's the same on both ears, or asymmetrical means it's, it's very different. On, on either ear. Progressive or sudden. Progressive is the hearing loss, you know, it begins here and it just progressively gets worse and worse and worse. Sudden hearing loss, boom, something has happened and they have a hearing loss. They were exposed to loud noise, they came down with, you know, meningitis, something, and they have a hearing loss, which is often difficult for parents as well. I think hearing loss in general is difficult. When you, when you find out your baby has a hearing loss, it's hard, but all to have normal hearing for two, three years, and then all of a sudden, it's hard. Um, and then fluctuating and stable. Fluctuating, as you can imagine, is very difficult. So you get these kiddos so they can hear, and then bloop, something switches, and then you have to go back to the audiologist, have you know, have those tweaks made, get them level, and then something switches again. So, and then stable, obviously, it, it remains the same over time. Do you have any questions on that? So, so technology, um, the hearing aids, cochlear implants, and the personal FM system. Has anyone before now heard of a cochlear implant? Oh, great, awesome. Usually when I say I teach hearing loss, children with hearing loss, like, oh, so you know sign language. It's like, no, our kids have an implant. Well, what's that? So, I'm, Nice to hear that you have heard of that. So hearing aids, um, as you know, amplify sounds. Um, so they, when you give a, a kiddo a hearing aid, they might actually hear sounds that they had never heard before. And um, background noise might be louder. Their own voice might appear louder. Sometimes they're like, oh, I didn't know I sounded like that, just because they weren't hearing it the way that they are with um, hearing aids. Um, hearing aids benefit children or individuals with mild to severe hearing loss. There are many different types. There's the behind the ear, completely in the canal, in the canal, in the ear, receiver in canal, and an open fit. The behind the ear is the most appropriate for children. All of these other ones are geared for adults. And so when you see an adult with a hearing aid, they all look different. So some might have this little itty bitty one that you know they're kind of trying to hide. Others might have a behind the ear. Other ones might have it like completely in, and you, you don't know, you might see a little cord or a wire but you don't know. But when you see a kiddo with a hearing aid, it's typically this, it's the most appropriate. This is called the behind the ear because it has a little hook, and my ears are too big for this. This is a, a baby one, but it goes behind the ear. And then there's an ear mold 
that is attached to this just to keep it in the ear. And sound then goes through this, through the tube, into the hearing aid. So I can pass these around. You will not break these. These are little dummy ones, so you will not, you will not break them. And then we have the cochlear implant. And the cochlear implant is relatively new. It has been around for about 50 years, which seems like a while, but it, children have only been being implanted with, in, with cochlear implants since the late 1980s and it has developed wonderfully. When the first child was implanted, they had this big box that they had near them or on them, and now this is what it has developed to. So you can imagine for a child to have a big old box where they, they're hearing sounds, but this is much more, much more appropriate. They can play sports, they can, they can swim, there's waterproof versions, they can really do so this is an electronic medical device, and it, it doesn't fix hearing, it takes the place of whatever was damaged. So if there's something in the cochlea that's damaged, the hair cells, this takes its place. And this, this doesn't, this does. This is the internal piece, and so it's surgically implanted. Um, so it's surgically implanted, so they actually cut behind. They used to cut like, like all along the head, and you have like a, three inch cut, and now they do it right behind the ear. A lot of times you don't even see it unless you like pull the ear back and like, oh yeah, you got one back there. Again, <laughs> medicine has gotten so much better. But so this is actually surgically implanted behind the skin, and then, so this is the internal piece, and then this is a magnet, because it's a dummy, there isn't a magnet on there. Just attaches to the side of the head, and then this little piece fits behind the head. So in here, there's the batteries, there's the microphone, everything that, that, help, that helps that child hear is all in this little wonderful device. Um, so as you, I mean, as you can see, the surgery is about one to three hours. It's done under general anesthesia, but these, but these kids have to go through a lot of testing beforehand. You don't find out your child has a hearing loss and say, I want an implant. Okay, come in tomorrow. It's not like you know getting glasses, it's a process. Um, so pre-surgery, they have to go through that hearing aid trial. And even if they have a profound hearing loss, and you know that those hearing aids are going to do absolutely nothing, you still have to do it. It's still procedure to prove that the hearing, the hearing aids are going to do absolutely nothing. And they don't. And then they have to do a whole bunch of assessments, just like any other surgery. You've got to do the MRI, the CT scan. Um, when they're older, actually like psychology exams, to know like, are you going to be able to handle this. Um, so surgery is one to three hours. It is low risk. There's minimal downtime and a brief hospitalization. Depending on what time you have surgery, these kids come home the same day. So there, if you have like the six, seven o'clock in the morning appointment, chances are these kids are coming home for dinner and they're going to be very bandaged. They've got, I mean, they have, they've had surgery. They've got this huge bandage that goes around their head that is terrifying to look at, but they're, they're bouncing around, you know, the parents are, okay, sit down, sit down, and they're running around, jumping off the bed and acting like literally nothing was wrong. They might have some pressure, dizziness, um, nausea, disorientation, um, but they're kids, they're very resilient. Now, when the, old, the older the children get, the more, you know, and sometimes the parents say, you, because if they have them, um, like if one, they have one when they're two years old and then they have a second one when they're four or five, the parents are like, you were fine when you were two. Like, you're milking this right now, I think. But, um, so I'll pass these around as well. And again, you will not break them there. They're dummies. Um, so I, I mentioned before that it's not a quick fix for hearing loss. Um, when you have the surgery, you actually only get that internal piece right away. They put that in, stitch you up, bandage you up, and you go home. You don't get um, you don't get that piece for about four to six weeks because just like any surgery, it needs to heal. You can't just go sticking a magnet on there when it's you know not completely healed yet. So one week after your in, um, implant surgery, you go back to the audiologist. They take out the stitches. They look at everything just like any other medical procedure. Make sure everything looks okay. And then four to six weeks later, you actually get that processor and it's turned on. 
which if you've seen any of the YouTube videos or you know anything going around social media, it's really amazing. And I've, I've had the opportunity to observe an implant surgery, denied it, I don't have the stomach for that, I don't want to see that, but I've actually been able to observe um, the initial stimulation with some of our kiddos and it is hands down one of the best things that you've ever seen. And so they're turned on in about four to six weeks, but they only really hear noises. They stick the implants on and then they also hook them up to machines and they just do noises like beeps. And then you, you see the child like, you know, because <laughs> they, they know like I'm supposed to be hearing something and they're doing it really softly just to, because you don't want to like go blaring something in their ears and they're gonna, you know, get scared. And so when they hear that first beep, it is, it is, it's pretty amazing. And then they go back at regular intervals for we call them mappings. It's like tweaking. We're adjusting their settings. So we'll start them off very, 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 very low. And so they'll start hearing like, oh, the traffic. Like that's, that's what a car sounds like. You know, you, these kids, like you just, the older kids, you see them light up like, that was an airplane because they've never, they've never heard it or they've heard it just slightly. And so the more that they go back and we adjust them, then we kind of, you, you find where they're, where they're appropriate. Because if you overstimulate them, you start to see facial like twitches. Like you'll be hearing noises and these kids are, you know, you don't want that. You know, you want them to hear appropriately. So it's a process and it takes up to a year. And then once they hit that year mark, if they've kind of leveled out like where, where it's appropriate hearing for them, then they go back on just annual basis. And they go back and they just do hearing checks and oh, you're good, go on back. And if, obviously if there's a problem, they go back more often. Um, so again, it's not a quick fix, which is difficult for some um, individuals out there who don't know. It's like, well, you gave them an implant. It's like, well, it, it's, not, it's not like glasses where you put them on and all of a sudden you can see. Um, sounds can be really confusing and overwhelming for these kiddos and they need regular and frequent education. And as part of the consult process of getting an implant, the audiologist will say, are you going to have therapy? Because you need therapy. You need, you don't necessarily, when they're older, you don't necessarily need to come to a specialized school, but you need to go to your audiologist or somewhere offsite, somewhere privately, and get the therapy. Because things sound different to these kids and it, they need to be trained almost to, to you know, distinguish what those individual sounds are, what they're hearing. Um, and then we have a personal FFFM system, which is just like your personal radio station. At Child's Voice, um, and I'm sorry I couldn't bring one because our kiddos are using them all, and we don't have dummy ones of those, um, are, they operate on frequencies. And so each classroom at Child's Voice has their own FM system. So when the kiddos come in, they say, can you sync me? And we sync them, I heard the beeps, and then they're sunk to us. And it is a direct link from the speaker to that child and their device. So they put in, I put pictures, yeah. So the teachers wear the transmitters, and they both do the same thing. There's just a couple different versions out there. And then they, these are called receivers. So this is a receiver for a hearing aid. And so it just, there's these three little prongs, and they just kind of, push in to the bottom of the hearing aid, and then this is one for an implant, and it just pokes into the side. And it's a direct link from the speaker to that device. So when they're in my room, let's say, I sync all of them, and they're hearing me. It doesn't block out what's being said behind them, but it kind of diminishes it. So if you've got, you know, we wouldn't encourage you to have an open window or encourage you to be teaching outside next to a highway, but if on the off chance you are, it's directly linking your the speaker's voice, whoever is wearing the transmitter, to that child. The caveat is, when they go to another classroom, if they don't say, can you sync me, they're still hearing me, <laughs> which is really interesting, because then you, you see, you'll see a kid sitting there, and you're, you're talking about, I don't know, and they start singing a song. And you're like, oh, really? I'm sorry, I'm using you, you're right here. But it's like, I'm not singing a song. Oh, I hear Mrs. So-and-so. And it's like, ah, come back to me. And then, so then we sync them and then they can hear. Um, but 
when they go to the mainstream, which is just when they go to the um, like their normal neighborhood neighborhood school, they have these FM systems and they are lifesavers. Because it, I mean, in mainstream, in that typical education classrooms, there's a small group here, there's a small group there, there's a small group there, and if the teacher's over there, but the, the kiddo's working here with his partners, the classmates can just wear the FM system. So it's diminishing that background noise. I think this must be what CC Bell was referring to in her book El Dumpo when she heard the picture to back. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What we, what we tell all of the teachers when our kiddos go back to their home schools is do not wear this in the bathroom or turn it off. <laughs> do not wear it in the lunchroom when you're talking with your, your teacher friends because they're still going to hear you. It's about a 50 foot radius. So if we always, and there's a, there's a mute button, which when, you know, when you're in a classroom, if you're going over here to, you know, talk to one child, you can just mute it. You don't have to turn it off and then turn it back on. There is a mute button, but um, yeah, kids, and kids will tell you when, when they're hearing something they don't want to hear, when they're hearing some juicy gossip, they're not going to tell you, oh, I'm hearing that. No, they're going to listen. Um, so, and we, we like all of our older children when they leave us to have experience with this. So when they go to their home school, they're the expert on that. They can say, oh, this is what you do. You do this and then you do this and look. You know, so we really want them to be the experts on that. Yes? At home, do their parents or family members wear one of those? This, um, at Child's Wish, the school district that they come from supply it to us. Parents have the opportunity to purchase one themselves. It's very expensive. They run anywhere from like two to $4,000. So some parents get one when their kids are in sports because you go to the soccer field, it's a nightmare to hear. I mean, children with normal hearing half the time aren't hearing what's going on. So it lets you. So they use it um, for sports, for at a restaurant. Um, so later when I talk about um, hopefully how this can help, like technology and stuff can help you, I say, ask if they have a personal FM. Because if you're doing story time and they have an FM, a personal one, bring it. You can wear it. I mean, but not all families choose, choose to purchase one. And some school districts say, hey, this is yours. But no, if you break it, you're not getting a new one. And others say it has to be kept at school. It's school property. It just depends. Did I see a hand? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, so now I'm going to go into some of the educational options. Oh, um, I wanted to show you a video for you. When I was talking about um, the implant activation. <laughs> so he heard it. Some kids will cry when they first hear that because it's they're like, what was that? <laughs> and so then you clearly know that they're here. And this one is a little older. search of implant activation and you'll get tons. Ah. Okay, so some of the, so once you find out that your child has a hearing loss, a lot of parents then go, okay, well now what? What, how do I educate my child? 
And so there's um, a couple different options. Sign language, obviously that's what you know everyone kind of assumes. Oh, you know sign language. I've had people say, oh, so you know Braille. I'm like, Braille? I'm like, yeah, Braille. And I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> you still, it's still trying to hard, it's hard to try to figure out like, how to respond to that. It's just, I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I'll just move on from that. And then usually at that point, I don't even go into an implant because they're, if they're thinking I know Braille, it would just be, it would be a lot. Um, but sign language, um, again, what we need, typical, the hand movements. Um, there are regional accents and dialects, and it's not universal. We had a kiddo at our school. Her family moved here from overseas, and the siblings knew Arabic sign language. And so this little girl was in our program learning how to listen and speak, and at home she's seeing Arabic sign language, and she's hearing English at school. It was, she, she's a tough cookie, and she, she pulled through. But um, so there is American Sign Language and then also all around. There's total communication, which combines the listening and speech with some hand movements. And then there's cued speech, which was um, created to help deaf children learn how to read. And there's, and I don't know cued speech, but there's different hand shapes that they put around different areas of their face. And that helps the kids see spoken English. Um, and then there's listening and spoken language which is where we come in. Um, Child's Voice is a listening and spoken language program. Um, we are located in Wooddale. We were founded in, um, right around Valentine's Day, 1996, by three families. These families were told that their child was deaf and they must learn sign language. And these families went, no, I don't want my babies learning sign language. I'm like, well, that's your choice. So these families actually formed together and Child's Voice came into existence. It began in Elmhurst. We were at a church um, in the basement and we had six children in the entire school. And then in 2003, we moved to Wooddale, which is where, where we are located now. But um, we are, our mission is just to empower children with hearing loss to be successful in all of the educational and social settings, just by giving them that the listening and language and speech ability. Um, so at Child's Voice, we have an early intervention program, an audiology program, a school program, and then various supports and outreach. Um, early intervention, as you know, that birth to three age is the critical time for just about everything in these kiddos' lives. That's when they're developing the most language and just really developing. So our early intervention program is birth to three. We have two locations. We have one location in Wooddale, which opened in, in well, began in 2000. And then we have, we have been trying for so long to get into Chicago to open up an early intervention program in Chicago. And so just a couple years ago in 2012, we did it. And so now it's just early, early intervention in the city, but it's there, it's a start. And so we have families from CPS and that go to our program first to three, and then they go back into CPS. Oh. But the objectives of the EI program is to provide listening and spoken language education, really increase parent education. A lot of what we do in the early intervention is coaching the parents. I mean, if you've got a kiddo who's three months old, a lot of they're obviously not talking, and so a lot of it is coaching those parents. This is what you can do at home. This is what you can do at home. This is what you can do at home. Because the parents come to us and they're like, oh, that's great. And then they go home, well, I don't know what to do. So it really is more on coaching. And then the older the children get, the teachers will model something with the child. And then we say, okay, now your turn. And so we're there still, but then the parents are actually doing those skills with them. Um, it, is, it occurs in the home from birth to 18 months. And then we have a toddler group and we also have social work services. Available. Our social worker literally began in, I think it was February, so we're very excited about that, but it's just an additional service that we can provide. Um, currently, I, because it's early intervention, the numbers fluctuate. We can have a kiddo come in today, um, yesterday, just because when they're, when they're diagnosed, they get referred to us. So currently, as of yesterday, we have 44 children in the early intervention program. 
We have 25 in Wooddale and we have 19 in Chicago. Um, so the home-based services occurs birth to three, but then when they turn 18 months, they can also add the toddler group. So they still get the home-based services through age three, but they can also start coming to the school for that toddler group. It is, I say a group, it is about four to six children. It's a very small group, but it's teaching them some of those peer interactions, which I think all 18 months to three-year-olds could use, but then also giving them that speech and language and listening at the same time. We talk all the time because our kiddos need to hear things again and again and again and again before they internalize it. And so that's all we do is talk. And then we tell the parents, like, this is what you can do at home. When you're making dinner, don't just sit there and what are you doing over there? Okay. Like, oh, mommy's stirring the pot. Oh, I need to get the, the rice and pour it in. The, you know, talk about everything. And so that's what we do all day long. And the kids play, but we're really just kind of following their lead. Um, so then when they become, when they turn the age of three, they are eligible to come to the school program. And we are a full day program. We run from 8.35 until 2.45. So yes, we have three-year-olds from 8.35 until 2.45. Yeah, and it's that's the reaction we get from a lot of parents is, wow, I'm not putting my baby on a bus for you know a six, seven hour day. It's like, oh, you, yeah, you are, you know, and they do. And it's very difficult. Sometimes we have the parents follow the bus and you just, because they're, they're, I mean, they're babies. It's, I would have a hard time. But so they go from age three until about seven or eight. So where we are, we begin in age three, we go to um, usually first, um, sometimes we have second graders. The school program is only located in Wooddale. We're not quite there yet with um, the Chicago um, branch. But we have an executive director, a principal, two audiologists, me. Um, we have a speech language pathologist, seven classroom teachers. And the classroom teachers are, there. it's a small group. They only have, they have six kids in a class, up to six kids but at one point in time, they only can have up to three kids. So, and when they're in that small group, it's one, two, or three kids, and then they flip, and then they get their other half of their group. So it's a constant flip. When they're not, when, they, when they've flipped, and they're elsewhere, they're either in the Discovery Center or in the Learning Center, which are our large group environments. And then we have a music teacher, and again, our social worker. Um, currently in the school program, we have 37 children and we pull from 23 different school districts. So when they turn the age of three, we go to the school and we have an IEP and we say, we want, you, we want them to come here. And school districts will usually, fingers crossed, toes crossed, everything will then support the children to come to Child's Voice because it's, it's very expensive. We run $40,000 a year. So it's very expensive, but when they go back to the mainstream, they need very minimal support. So you get them early, you get them educated, you get them listening and speaking, and they go back and they need very minimal support. Um, so the objectives of the school program, again, what I explained, the small and large group, it's play-based learning. A lot of times the kids just think they're playing and we're like, oh no, no, we've tricked you, you're learning. Um, we again talk all the time. We are integrating speech and listening into everything. We teach the children self-advocacy. I heard someone speaking before, I don't know who it was, before the meeting about self-advocacy. And we actually have a class that we teach these kids how to advocate for themselves. And our school, the school program is divided into primary one and primary two. The kids say P1 and P2. It's a status symbol when they move up to P2. I don't, no one can figure out why, but it is to them. Um, so P1 is, the kids are age three and four, so it runs like a typical preschool. What you would see at a, you know, a neighborhood preschool. They're um, the small and large group instruction. So the kids, um, like I said before, they're small group and then they go to the Discovery Center. So it literally is a 30 minute flop because no three or four year old can sit still for more than 30 minutes. And that's really about, by the time that they're wiggling, they're done, we kind of move them off. Um, so they're in there for small group. We are working on the speech. They have direct speech instruction, listening, language, um, pre-academics, 
Our curriculum is aligned to the MLMA learnings, early learning standards. Our older, so the four-year-olds have self-advocacy, but it's like a modified, it's a modified version. Um, but they're still getting it. So then when they turn five, they walk to the other end of the hallway, which again, the status, I don't get it. And that's the, the primary two program. Same thing, it's the 30 minute flop, small group to large group. Um, currently the learning center in the large group only has seven to eight children. So it's, it runs like a typical kindergarten, but we're just smaller. We're still, our large group is still small. Um, we have thematic learning, everything is aligned to Common Core. The kiddos have individual speech work with the speech pathologist, and then they also get it in the classroom. And again, everything is language. We're, when we're teaching math, we're teaching reading, we're throwing in language with everything because um, our kids don't learn incidentally, so they don't just hear things and, oh yeah, yeah. They have to be taught everything. And so we're teaching the academics, but we're also teaching all that vocabulary and language that goes with it. Um, so in, once they are in P2, we have this weekly self-advocacy class. And what we were finding was when, before we started this, our kids would go to their neighborhood home school and this would be them. Mm -hmm. Did you understand that? Mm -hmm. What's two plus two? Mm -hmm. They weren't, they were just, they didn't want to be wrong. They were thinking that if they had to admit that they didn't hear something or they didn't understand something, they were wrong. And so we're like, oh no, 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 you're not wrong. So we created this self-advocacy class to really teach them how to stand up for themselves, how to talk to the teacher, how to talk to others in the community. So we really increased their understanding of hearing versus hearing loss because of our population. They look around, okay, you've got implants, you've got implants, oh, you have a hearing aid. Everybody does. And then they go out into the mainstream and they're like, oh, no one in my class has an implant or a hearing aid. So it's really educating them on that some do and some don't. And this year we actually have a staff member that has, she, she has a hearing loss herself and she has bilateral implants. And so we use her all the time, like, look, adults can have this too. And they're like, oh, that's amazing. We try to teach them that when they leave us, they're still gonna have their implants. That's come up at times, like, oh, well, when I leave, I'll just take them off. No. Um, so we really just kind of, we teach them about their devices, about how to advocate for themselves. And we have a program called Mainstream Experience, um, where our kiddos, we actually <laughs> kind of throw them to the wolves. It sounds really cruel, but we teach them some basic skills, and then we put them into a general education mainstream classroom in Wooddale and the teacher teaches, we're there obviously, we don't leave, but it, we really expect them to stand for them, stand up for themselves and practice those skills that have been taught. So it's, it's, it's really amazing the first time they're all deer in headlights and you feel so bad for them. And then at the last couple times, they're talking to their peers and they're, you know, they're doing just fine. So as a part of the class, we teach repair strategies. And so when they need help, instead of just saying the dreaded, huh? which is like figure it out on a chalkboard to us, it's we put more words with that. So what, what did you say? I didn't hear you, I don't know what you said, I can't understand you, tell me again, all of those. And we then sabotage situations. So we'll be teaching a lesson and we'll, we'll be doing some, you know, some of this stuff. Hey, can you move your hands? Can you pull the book down? You know, so really get them to practice in that environment that they're comfortable in with us. Um, asking for clarification. So really, they know that they heard something, but they're just clarifying what, did you say whatever? Will you say the last part again? They heard the first half, but I didn't hear what you said at the end. Or I thought you said, well, a lot of times you'll know they didn't understand you when you get the look, and it's like, well, what, did, what do you think I said? Oh, I thought you said, and it you know, was completely, completely wrong. And so just help them with that. Um, and then asking for more information. When they, if they don't hear something correctly and they can't see it, they might have, they might not hear the beginning letters of the sound or the beginning letters of the word. And so they're like, wait, what did you say? What does that mean? And so then they'll, then they'll, when they say like, um, like repair, if, if they, if they hear pair, like a pair strategy, what does that mean? And then you're like, oh no, 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 repair. So then they're asking you for what does that mean, for more information on something. And then that's usually when you can determine that there was that communication breakdown and then you can, you can help them. 
Um, so here's the mainstream, the mainstream experience that I was talking about. Um, so at, at, um, at Child's Voice, we also have an audiology department with two full-time audiologists, which I don't know how they do it. They, they service our children, and then they also provide services to the public. And so we're a referral site. So when children fail their newborn hearing screening, we're on the list that, that the audio, audiologist is like, hey, your kid failed here. And you're like, okay. But there's a list of places that you can go for follow-up services. And we are one of those. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of skip over some of this because um, for time. But we can do a whole bunch of, uh, our audiologists can do a whole bunch of different testing. Um, and we have a PD program, which is where we can actually do newborn hearing screening like reassessments. So when they fail, sometimes there might just be fluid in the ear from birth still and they just need to be retested. We can be one of those sites. And we don't use sedation, so we just get the kiddo to sleep, which sometimes you're sitting there for an hour before you can even begin. The kiddo sleeps on their mom, they, you know, they put all the, the things on their head and they can do the test there without having to sedate this little baby. We just lost my child. Oh. <laughs> and outreach, we have parent education, we have quarterly, um, like this, quarterly meetings where the parents come in and we teach them and we educate them about various different topics. Um, mainstream support, which is me, um, I actually follow the kids in the mainstream, so once they graduate, I get to still go see them, which is the best part of my job, and I just observe them and I go to their classroom and I just sit there with my computer and I type, teacher said this, child did this, teacher said this, child did this, so the parents know, like, yes, everything's going okay. It's really like, it's okay. Because it, it's, it's terrifying to come from us and just kind of go into the world where they don't really have many services. Or with us, they had you know, everything. Um, so here's some stuff for that hopefully will help you on some communication strategies. So the environment, when you are having a, um, like a reading time, you know, story time, anything, um, make sure that our kiddos can see you. Um, I see you're taking a picture. I can I can give this presentation out so you don't even have it. You don't have to take it. <laughs> sure, okay. um, so, um, so just make sure that our kiddo can see you. Don't put them at the back of the room behind the tallest kid in there because our kids need to be able to see you. Because our kids can hear, but they also need to be able to see your face and make, because the older kids can lip read. Um, so if, we, if this is if this is how you're I, I don't know how you do circle time but if this is how you do it if it's in a horseshoe our kiddos would benefit best from being at one of these ends because you can see me but you can also see all of your classmates so when you guys start you know, answering questions our kiddo can look teacher child teacher child back and forth um, place them near quiet children which I know it, depending on the age is difficult but um, don't put them near the little kiddo who's going to be talking the whole time because they're not ever gonna hear that child and not the not you. Um, place them away from any loud noise, open windows, the dreaded, those the heating and cooling systems that thump on a regular basis. Put them away from that. Um, try closing all the doors. Um, and this is this is could get, could get tricky, but avoid hard, smooth floors. Depends on I don't know how all the libraries are set up, but if it's carpeted, <coughs> amazing. Because every time that it's a hard floor and a kid you know, has something on his shoe and that ding, ding, or if you drop something. I mean, this can be very distracting for a child with, with the hearing loss. So we say, put the, I put tennis balls on there. When, we're, when we send these kids back to district, we request tennis balls um, on the bottoms of the chairs because then that scraping, which again is like finger nose on a chalkboard for everyone, but that scraping is just unnecessary added noise that our kids don't need to hear. So you put tennis balls on the bottom of the chairs and it helps tremendously. Put rugs down. Obviously, you can't you can't just say, "Oh, I've got a child with hearing loss. I need carpeting," because you're going to get laughed at. <laughs> but put rugs down. There's other things that um, that can be done. So um, classroom support. If you, are, I don't, and I again, I don't know where you do story time. If you have like a little classroom space, or if it is just open in the library. Um, you can ask the family if they have that personal FM system. If they do, 
wonderful, but parents can just give you a quick, okay, this is what you do, you know, pop it, on, pop it around your neck and you can go. Um, use visual aids as often as possible. Um, write, for the older kiddos, write and display key vocabulary words because they can hear it, but they benefit from seeing it as well. Because our kids, the older kids can read, and so they're hearing it and then they're like, yeah, I'm not sure, and they can look and get it visually as well. Um, provide a written list to families of any new vocabulary words that you're gonna be talking about because parents can do some pre-teaching at home because then when you're saying it, they've already heard it. So they're not having to sit there and try to figure out what that means because they've already heard it from their families at home. Um, provide additional copies of anything that's being discussed. So if you're, if you're, if you know next week we're gonna be reading whatever you have, like Curious George book or whatever, tell parents and they can check it out from the library or you can give them a copy. Again, they can hear it at home first, do a little pre-teaching and then hear it from you. Um, closed captioning, if possible, and I know some of those, the older videos just don't have closed captioning, but just try to find ones that do. Um, so again, use the FM system and this is when like you are, you yourselves are speaking. Um, Clearly introduce new topics. A lot of times our kiddos don't realize that the topic has changed. So they'll respond to something that was what you were talking about five minutes ago. And then all the other kids are like, what are you talking about? The social piece comes in then. Try to just say, okay, now we're gonna talk about and make sure that the kiddo is following you, that you're moving on. Um, call in the other kiddos by name if you, if you know them. Otherwise, if you don't like, what, oh, Yes, you over there in the yellow, yes? You know, <laughs> kind of just so the kids can be like, okay, now you're talking and follow that. Because again, then they can see, they can read the lips and hear at the same time. Um, summarize and repeat what the other kids say. So if someone answers a question, don't just say, uh-huh, yeah, sure. Now I'm gonna ask this. Like, oh yes, I heard you say that Curious George was at the library. Yes, that's right, Curious George was at the library. Summarize that so they're hearing it more than once. Um, check uh, or repeat important words and phrases. So if you know something is key to the story, repeat it multiple times so our kiddos are hearing it multiple times. Check comprehension through open-ended questions. Don't ask yes and no questions because our, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our kiddos don't want to be wrong. Who wants to be wrong? But so if they don't know, they're going to just do this, uh-huh, yeah. So ask more open-ended questions like, well, what happened after that? Or how do you think they were feeling? Or how would you feel in that situation? More open-ended because then you'll, you'll know from their response that they understood or that they didn't understand and then you can go from there. Um, if you have rules and expectations, display them, talk about them. Our kiddos have been in school <laughs> since they were three. So they, are very, they know how to sit, they know how to follow the rules. But it's always nice just to review them and talk about them and then provide clear rules and expectations. What's okay for one child should be okay for our, the other children, which again is, you know, across the board. But you'd be surprised in some, you know, some schools we go into, it's like, well, how is that okay for you, but not you? So just make it clear and concise for everyone. Um, so communication, how do you talk to our kiddos? Like this, talk naturally, um, project your voice, you don't have to be shouting. You don't have to be screaming at our kids. They're gonna step away from you like, why are you yelling at me? They, because they can hear. Um, so face the kids when you're speaking because when you turn, you can still hear me, but our kiddos have just lost that light of sight. And so they might, they might not hear everything because there's this, the greater distance in between and there's something blocking them. Try not to block your face when speaking you're reading a book try to keep it you know off to the side not directly in front of you if you don't understand don't pretend our kiddos don't I, I think all kids don't like that but ask them questions like try to understand what they were saying like I heard you say tell me more like what did you say after that like try and they might get frustrated they might just be like forget it I'll, I'll tell you later you know but try don't just pretend don't fake it they know repair strategies, use repair strategies back to them. Like, I didn't understand you. What did you say? Tell me again. Um, so at Child's Voice, we tell, I mean, we tell these families to read your child daily, obviously. 
use props, create your own stories. You don't have to necessarily read the story verbatim. Make up your own story. If you've got a kiddo who is speaking in, in one single words, you're not gonna read them a chapter book. You're gonna summarize because they're gonna lose interest in you because that's not where they are language-wise. Um, read books again and again and again. The repetitiveness is giving those kids that good language model. The, most stories have great appropriate language for kids and they're getting that language model from you and then also through literature. Um, discuss the vocabulary, teach the vocabulary. If you know there's a word that the kids are just not gonna know, teach it to them. Take the, you know, the minute, two minutes to say, this is what, bubblegum is, but you know, whatever, and talk about it and teach it. Relate it back to them so they have that experience that they can, you know, relate to. Enrich simple stories. If, if you're reading a very simple story, you can add language to it. You don't have to necessarily tell it. You can add language if that's where they are. We tell parents to take books everywhere. We encourage like a bag of books in the car. These kids sometimes travel for an hour to get to Child's Voice throw two, three books in a bag for them that they can read on the bus. So, um, just so they're getting that language and the, and the literature exposure. Um, read everyday items out loud when you're at the store. Talk about the names of the cereal you're buying. Talk about the granola bars, the fruit snacks. Like, show them that, you know, there is, there is meaning behind all of that. Visit the local libraries and then create a home library. I know the older, I mean, I go through this all the time when it's birthday time. Oh, what does your son need? He doesn't really need anything. Books, ask for books. You can start your own home library then. Um, so again, how do you reach to a child with a hearing loss? If they have that FF, FM system, use the FM system. And pretty much the same thing is just when you're speaking to them. Project your voice, again, you don't have to shout, read an appropriate pace, read with expression, but try to avoid kind of like disguising your voice. Sometimes when you read about like different characters, it, if, you're, if you disguise your voice too much, they're, they're, it's not gonna be clear anymore. You can read with expression, but try to keep, um, try to keep using a normal voice. Um, face the child, don't block your face. If there's illustrations in it, display them so the kids can hear what you're saying and then also have that visual to go along with it. Finger sweep so the kids are you know learning, you read left to right, all of that. Use props, read near their language level, which you'll know when, you're talk when you talk to these kids, you'll know where they're at. If they're answering you in one and two words, like where did you go? Go store, go store, that's near the language. You don't have to read the whole story in two words, but simplify it for our kiddos. Or if they have more language, enrich that as well. And you can also talk to the parents and say like, where, what's their language like? You know, how many words are they stringing together at a time? And kind of hear, you know, go along from there. Frequently discuss the story, discuss the vocabulary, ask questions, um, encourage that text to self and text to text connections. Again, read it again and again and again for our kiddos. Um, and allow, I don't know if you can see that down there, it's on the blue, but allow questions to be asked. Our kids ask a lot of questions and they'll know if someone's like, you have another question, really. Like, they'll know, and they're gonna be like, okay, I'm just not asking anything else. And then they might be missing things. They might not know what words mean, but they're not gonna wanna ask if that's, you know, they don't really get a warm and fuzzy response. Um, so then how do you pick the right book? We, we tell parents the pick the acronym, P is for purpose, I is for interest, C is for comprehension, and K is for know the words. So when we send parents to the library and you know, try to tell, help them or tell them to pick out books, to kind of think about this, like what, are, what is the kiddo gonna be reading this book for? Is it pleasure? Are they learning something out of it? Um, are they gonna read it out loud at class? Or are they just reading it at home? Interest, what are they interested in? Sometimes parents want their children to read books about animals and the kid wants to read about vehicles and they're not going to read that book. So really try to find books that are of interest to the children and then kind of branch off from there. My son loves vehicles and if it's not a vehicle, we don't play with it, we don't wear it on our clothes, we, it's, it's got to be a vehicle. But branch off from that. So instead of just vehicles, like well how are vehicles made? Like let's visit the racetrack, like try to find other things 
somewhat related to branch out from. Comprehension, to check to see is the kiddo gonna understand what's being discussed? Is, is the content like way too, way too high or way too low? Is it appropriate for their language level? And then the five finger rule, which is amazing and parents just love that. So if they look at a page and they don't know if there's four to five words that they don't know, automatically right there, the book's too hard. And parents love that because they literally go in and they're like, read that page. And they're like, oh, too hard, go back, read that one. And it, but it helps them just try to find the book that, you know, a book that's most appropriate for them. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I got worried when I saw the time. I was like, oh no. Uh, so, questions, yes? Oh, yes, yeah, so, um, can I grab one of those books that you were? some kiddos that sometimes the parents are like, nope, my kid's fine. They'll be just fine. Like, no, they might not be, you know, and then a lot of times the older they get, they realize like, oh, we should have at least done hearing aids or done it and we should have listened to, you know, these other people. Um, and then that, that it's, the earlier that you can give these kids the help, the better, because the older they get, their brain is developed and it's harder to learn language. I mean, think like if if I try learning a second language now, there's no hope for me. But if I learned it when I was four and five, there might there's be hope. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. With, with any kind of language, yeah. Yeah. it might be slower. Yeah. yeah. But are there people that cannot be helped by hearing aid or hearing aid? Oh, like based on like anatomy and stuff? Right. Yes, yes, yeah. Because sometimes there's just like something internally is just so deformed or absent that that's it. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing that can be done. How are you funded? And the children who come from all these different districts, do they contribute into the work? Yeah, we are a not-for-profit organization, and so we have many fundraisers throughout the year just to you know keep us going. That we really rely on funds from that, and then for the school program, the districts support, and so. They actually cut us a check. I don't know how that works, but we get paid through the school districts themselves. And in the this currently, we have every single one of our children is supported by school districts. In the past, there we always had like one or two that the district would not support, and then parents private pay. So you pay a college tuition at three. You know, so I was wondering about uh, the financial impact on the families, especially. But then you were saying that like before they can have the implant, they have to have hearing aids first, even though you know for sure it's not gonna work. Not gonna work. So I'm just wondering, you know, the financial things that families have to. Insurance will cover hearing aids. Um, most insurances will cover, will cover hearing aids. And so that is taken care of by that. It's a fight to have insurance companies pay for the implants. And a lot of times they'll pay for one, but they won't pay for another. And then you have to go through the whole appeal process. And you know, it's, it's hard, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, it's very difficult. But um, nine times out of 10, it, it works out in the long run. There's other programs and organizations out there that you can find and will help support. Like if, it, if an insurance company will say, well, we'll pay for half. You know, well, these are expensive. So then there's other um, like groups and things that can offer support. And is the therapy that, that occurs like after the implant, is that usually covered by insurance or is that the school district or is it some combination? Well, if the kiddos are at Child's Voice, mm -hmm. then they get that therapy at school. So it's just part of the school day. 
Um, the hospital, the implant centers have resources available through them that then they can bill, like the hospital organization can bill insurance and they can get it that way. There's also private pay. Um, I worked with a graduate who got a second implant after she graduated from us and I, she happened to live down the street from me so I'm like, I'll just do it. And so I just went to her house and it was private. They just paid me privately. So there's difference. There's different options. Can you clarify on the FM mm -hmm. system, can that be used in conjunction with other devices or is that a device in and of itself? So if someone's using a cochlear implant, would they use the FM system in addition to that? Yes, yes. So there was that, um, uh, there's that little piece there. So these, uh, so they have their implants, and then there's this little piece that just plugs into it, and then so they can they can hear with just the implant, but then when they plug that FM system, they're hearing it's that. Right yeah, but they're hearing direct link from whoever's wearing the receiver. So they can wear both at the same time. And typically we try to get an FM system on these kids once they're reliable reporters, because they need to be able to say, I'm in your class, but I'm still hearing you over there. So they need to really be reliable because when you have a hearing aid, you can hear, like, you know, like when, it, when the ear mole comes out, you can hear that feedback. You can hear what they're hearing. And you, if you pull it out and you're hearing you over there, well, you know they're not hearing you. But with an implant, you don't you don't hear what they're hearing. They take it off, and you don't hear anything. So they really need to be older and reliable, and you can trust that they're going. So we would never put an FM on a three-year-old who was just newly implanted. You know, they they have to be older. And, but yes, they can wear. And can it be used without someone? Can it be used for someone? Do they, they have to have the transmitter? Yeah, yeah. So if you just put on that little receiver at the bottom but the, the transmitter isn't on, they're, they're not hearing. They're still hearing through their implants, but they're not hearing that direct link through anybody. So, and that's why when, when they're in the mainstream and they, the teacher goes to the bathroom, they just mute themselves or turn it off. They don't have to take everything off. It's, it's on there. And then when they, turn, when they come back from the bathroom, they turn the transmitter back on and it's just automatically synced back. So they can hear through that again. We were talking about ADA recently, and I'm wondering how does, how do you, maybe you do or don't know, but per, libraries, are we required in any part of ADA to support people with hearing loss that have these types of devices? Are we required as part of ADA to have things like this? That I'm not sure. I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, I would think you just have to make the necessary accommodations. Well, right. I know we have one, and we purchased it because we had a mother who came to us and said, my daughter has this device, yeah. and we purchased one to support her. We haven't been asked to use it since. I don't know if we purchased it because we felt it was the right thing and the good thing to do, yeah. or if we purchased it because we were bound to. And then it, to me, it's thinking, okay, well, if you have that device, to be able to say, our library has this ability to support yeah. any type of... To be able to publicize it. Right, to market that we yeah. have it available. Yeah, because I mean, like, I mean, our kiddos can hear without it, like without the FM system. Right. But, but it's it, support. It is, it is a tremendous support. And we've noticed, we had some, you know, some kids with some behaviors, and we're like, well, you know, put the FM on, and then all of a sudden the behavior's gone because they're hearing so much better. They're not hearing all this distraction around them. If you've got a kid who's easily distracted, they're, I mean, that's a child. They're gonna be over here. Oh, well, well there's a garbage truck out there, you know. But with that FM, it kind of like, it doesn't block out, but it really reduces that background noise and it is that direct link to the teacher and they can hear so much better. It's clear they're not, they're not distracted by the other things. Are the personal FM systems compatible with uh, various devices or do you have to get the one that matches? <laughs> <laughs> there is a couple, that's a great question. There's a couple different options and um, Yes and no. With some of the newer technology, it's more universal. Some of the older ones, it's like, well, you, the implant has been upgraded, so it's not compatible with this FM, FM system, so you need a new one. The newer technologies are trying to be more universal. But you also just don't 
Google FM system and buy one that way, you go through your audiologist and they, they know, and they'll, they'll know what device you're wearing and what's compatible and what's not. So they're really your, your lifeline. Well, I guess, I think probably the question since we're all librarians is, which one do we buy so that we can support them? Well? <laughs> Yeah, well, well back to our libraries to buy one. Yeah, that you'd have to really see like it, it, it's kind of hard to answer because you have to know like what like what devices are coming in, like what population, what devices your population is going to have. Um, there are things they're called sound field systems that a lot of the schools are actually getting for all kids. It's it's like an FM system, but it's not a personal FF, FM system. The teacher wears a microphone and her voice is just projected throughout the classroom. That, I would say, would be your best bet, unless you know that you have this family that has that implant, you know? But in, even if you do know that you have that family, what if another family moves in and then they're not compatible? You know, and I don't know if how, what funding is like if you have unlimited funds to just go buy things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that makes sense. And I can, I have some business cards up here. I'm sure that there's not enough. Um, but I, somewhere, oh, yep. There's my information. So if you want to call me or email me if you have any other questions. I emailed you the presentation. I don't know how. We can distribute Just that distribute out. it out that way. Okay. That way or upload it to the blog or something. With this um, lovely video. <laughs> yes, we'll make sure that everybody gets it. Okay. This. okay. Just because the tips, um, like the tips for, like I, I, I felt bad. I saw you taking pictures. Just so then you have a paper, mm -hmm. a paper, paper copy of that as well. So. Anyone else have any other questions? And I, like I said, I have business cards up here. So I, I highly doubt it's enough. But if you want to grab one, I just thought you might enjoy knowing that uh, BYE and BAR are mixed up all the time. I work with talking books, and they're always expecting us to have. Um, things that raise the volume of things and phones that are uh, TTYs and all that type of thing. So when you were looking for Braille, we have Braille. We send the others to you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? No. I did one time have a patron come in and ask if we had, um, they were looking for, they were hard of hearing and they had, uh, they were had been looking at large print books and they wanted to know if they had special large print editions of books on tape. And it wasn't me that they asked for the, the same ones that came and told me, they said, did they think they were going to talk a lot louder? Yeah. <laughs> like, what did you say? Sometimes you get asked a question and you're just like. It actually got turned into an unshell. <laughs> you know, oh, it was kind of your response. No, it's good. It actually turned into an unshell. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Melissa, thank you so much for coming today. No, really thank you. Your